watching us from VicDef on their streaming service will even know That's what it. rude words you just signed. I just signed one. Okay. Yeah. Let me guess it's the sort of thing that in any playground would pretty much <laughs> get you get you right up there. And it's pretty obvious. I think it's not one that you have to decode in any pe- special way. Can you do it again? What was it? Oh, no, do I have I don't <laughs> do it again? I'm not doing it again. You make me do things. I don't like it, John Fain. Stop. Oh, it's so easy Do you to... know any sign language? No. No. No, no I'm embarrassed to say. Okay. I I've can never, teach you why I want playtime, but I've that's never, as much. I've never been taught any, and I've not had people in my immediate community who I've, other than if I've paid for an interpreter that I've needed to communicate with. And it's, I mean, I think it's a really interesting debate. But I do remember interviewing before some people from the deaf community who wanted to bring their, their children when they had two deaf people who had children and their children could hear, but they didn't want their children. They, they wanted the house to work on Auslan rather than the kids talking to each other when the parents couldn't hear because it left the parents out. And I Absolutely. remember having this conversation with them. It's a, it's a, it's a language of its own and it's yeah. really, it's like bilingual families. Yeah, you yeah. Know, we're looking at it as a legitimate um, and very important language within the family. Yeah, yeah, and you end up having all these kind of, you know, mind-bending conversations with people where you go, well, I'd never even thought about that as an issue, but of course it is, yeah. Of course it is, absolutely. I look forward very much to the chat a little bit later with Jen. Yeah, so there we go. Hey, um, and what's been happening in your world? I guess the most amazing thing that happened in my world over the weekend was that the uh, four-year-old in my household took the training wheels off. He didn't actually take them off. We took them off for him. I was, I was wondering if your four-year-old <laughs> was wielding the spanner, yeah? No. And so he embarked upon his first uh, solo mission without the training wheels. And? I played uh, the Rocky, you know, the uh, Eye of the Tiger theme song as he, as, he <laughs> <laughs> as he left the front gate and he immediately fell down. Of course. And what, you know, I don't know if you do this. I bet you don't. But anything in my life where you've, like, there's a new challenge, I research it to, uh, till the cows come home. <laughs> What, taking trainer wheels off? Yeah. Well, how do you teach a child how to ride a bike? Don't you remember? No, I don't remember. It's one I of those things that just happens is that is not um, – I don't think it's that obvious. Okay, that you, ru- you go across to the park where the grass is soft yeah. so that they don't land on the asphalt and then you take the trainer wheels off and then you run along behind them holding onto the shoulder – until you're totally out of breath and they've taken off and then they never even look back. Do you know what? I would like to say to you that Pedal Magic, the website that I oh found no. from, <laughs> from the 1980s, would like to disagree with your description you, you of teaching. You actually went online to find and out what to do. Pedal Magic is a painted um, uh, process of training someone how to ride a bike. No. Yes. It's no. Got a, I've got the patent number here if you want to check it out. No. Yes. This guy in the 80s was so successful at teaching people how to ride, he could do it in under five minutes. And you get, you get a description of how to do it and times that it should take you. So 1.5, you know, three, one and a half minutes to do a certain part of the training, two and a half for the next, and for the launch, you get about, you know, two minutes to go or something. So what did you do? I followed it to the T. And did it work? Well, I think it's going to. It's really actually pedal magic that got, you know, took America by storm for about two weeks is actually quite good. It's all about... What do you do? Training the person, whoever they are, young or old, to get on the bike. And instead of when you're falling to whatever side you'll fall on, yeah. instead of resisting that fall by turning your wheel to the opposite direction, yeah. you actually go with the fall. What? So you and crash into the ground. No, what you're doing initially is getting them to feel the shift in the in the handlebars with the weight of the fall. So you do that for one and a half minutes, okay? For one and a half minutes, you'd be one on the ground in two seconds. <laughs> Their feet are still on the ground. Oh, I so see. So they're just vibing on it. They're just oh, okay. like going so they're, either they're way. They're propping themselves up yep. with their feet on the ground, uh-huh. falling sideways, and learning. Yeah to turn into the fall exactly. rather than against the fall. So you don't get that wobble going. That's right. Then right. feet go to uh, pedals and yeah. you stand behind them and you get them to fall either way and do the same thing. But this so time you simulate the fall. Simulate the fall. Right. I think you get about one and a half minutes for that. You I'm simulate losing. it, then you stimulate it. <laughs> I'm not sure if that's exactly the wording that Pedal Magic used. Am I having to pay them every time I use their name? No, you get it. you're advertising them. <laughs> that's all I? they want. Okay. No, it really it doesn't exist anymore. It's just oh, this okay. website that, right. you know. Anyway, and then comes the launch. So then, you, then the moment that you were describing before where you just throw them off into the world and they can ride a bike didn't quite happen no. to that level. But right. um, I think it's really got something to it. But hang on. Can we go back a step? Sure. How long were the trainer wheels on? 
Oh, not that long. We didn't ride that much. Because isn't the whole idea of the trainer wheels that they do all that stuff while they've got the trainer wheels on? John Fain, Paddle Magic will tell you that training wheels are actually in opposition to learning how to ride the bike. <laughs> because what um, training wheels do is yeah. actually get you to resist the fall. So you've got to balance, you've got to counterbalance with the training wheels on. But aren't the trainer wheels also adjustable so gradually you lift them higher and higher until the kids don't need them at all? Only if you've got a fancy bike. I've never seen, are they? Yeah, yeah. You, and, and we found ours you, on the got, side of the road. Oh, they've got those brackets with slots on them so right. you can loosen the bolts and then lift them a little higher and a little higher and a little higher until they don't need them at all. And then just like, off. Gotcha. Maybe and then they're off on the Tour bit. de France before you know. <laughs> it's a pretty good moment though, isn't it, in your life when you learn how to ride a bike for the first time. Yeah. Apparently a skill you'll never forget. Yeah. That's probably right, although... There are some issues for some people because later in life it can get perilously difficult and tricky. What do you mean? Well, not everybody, first of all, maintains their balance That's forever. True. Secondly, your, your hips start to go and then you get your dreadful, your mammals, middle-aged men in Lycra. Do you wear Lycra? I don't know. Let's talk about it. I don't do that racy, bikey thing. I just... You go on your... Um... I've got a stupid old daggy bike that I've had for a million... Actually... I recently bought a new bike in a garage sale. I'd had a stupid old daggy bike. What, a push bike we're talking? Yeah, yeah, bicycle. Because you, you ride the motorised ones too. Yeah, yeah, but I've got, a, I've got a bicycle I've had for years that I used to sort of go to the shops and, you know, do short trips and things. No Lycra? And, no, definitely not. And then I was at a garage sale around the corner and this guy had a really flash bike. And it was a couple of hundred bucks. It was Whoa. like, I don't know, a couple of thousand dollars worth of bike. Like I would never, ever buy disc brakes. You know, those fancy disc brakes. I think I know. And so... In the end, at the end of the day, I said, look, if you still haven't sold it by the end of the day, I'll come back. And at the end of the day, you still hadn't sold it. I came back and got it really cheap. Did, when you ride a good bike, because I've never ridden a good bike, I yeah. just ride those old ones, yeah. you realise that it's actually quite a pleasurable thing. Yeah, yeah. There is a difference. You get what you pay for. It's taken me years yeah. to come to terms with this, but it's true. Everybody who um, is not of the Lycra wearing always says it's never going to happen. But yep. I do believe there is a time for every person that Lycra becomes a, a really genuine proposition. No. I put it to you again, John Fain. No. Is there ever going to be a chance that it will happen? No. When you retire? No. <laughs> Nothing? No. Not even a little short here and there? Shorts. <laughs> yeah, I can wear shorts. I can do no, that. the Lycra shorts. No? Yeah, yeah. It's not going to happen. Uh, your description is just how I taught my son. Who? Why would you bother with a website? Uh, because I don't understand life. Lisa, Websites are great. Lisa says training wheels need to be slightly raised each time you ride. There you are, Lisa. Thank you. So the child develops their sense of balance until the wheels are well off the ground. Thank you, Lisa. My sister took the wheels off and pushed me down a hill. That's how <laughs> I learned. Why is swearing in Auslan okay? People who understand Auslan are listening and may well be offended, says Antigone. How dare you? I hope you did offend them. In you fact, made me do it, John Fain. You no, take full responsibility. In fact, Jen Blythe from uh, Vic Def, who's here, she laughed. So that's sort of all right, I think, isn't it? Yeah. I hope so. It's no secret. Tell the kids, look forward, don't look down or look at the pedals. That's true. But you've got to have great faith in living, don't you, to do that? Well, no, that's what... Well, there you are, see? That's the metaphor. Isn't it? It's like we're asking little people to do pretty scary things. What? Ride a bike? Yeah. You oh, get on a thing that's going to... You're a helicopter mama. You, you're no, worried about wrapping your kids in cotton wool. No, I'm willing to throw them down the, the hill, but I'm also empathetic to the experience of... You know, the fragility of living. Oh, there's going to be a grazed knee in there somewhere. 16 <laughs> minutes past 11. Jacinta Parsons, my co-host. She's music director at Double J and ABC Local. And on the Conversation Hour today, you can watch the Auslan interpretation of the Conversation Hour on livestream.com slash VicDef or through the VicDef website because Jen Blythe, advocacy manager of Deaf Victoria, will be one of our guests. But first up, the Human Rights Commission, now retired former race discrimination commissioner, Graeme Innes, who's written the book about his life and how many ceilings he's smashed through on the way. He'll be our first guest in just a moment. It's 17 minutes past 11. Hi, this is Taylor Mc... The Reels. Love will find a way. 20 minutes past 11 here on 774 ABC Melbourne, ABC Victoria Digital Radio and the World Wide Web. Our first guest joining us in just a moment, uh, Jacinta. Yes. A balanced bike is the way to go. No training wheels required, says Annabelle. I learnt in 1929 on a two-wheel oh. solid tyre bike called a ferry cycle. Bert says that cost five shillings. 
I bought on. a pink bike from the second hand place for my daughter, told her it was magic and it couldn't fall over and she just got on and rode perfectly. <laughs> there you go. Good mental uh, strategies. My 10 year old absolutely refuses to learn how to ride a bike and has done so now for five years, says Ray in Muralbach. Ray, pedal magic, pedal magic, Ray. <laughs> Leon in Fitzroy North says, you're a cheapskate. You shouldn't buy a bike at a garage sale. No wonder Australia's economy goes to pot. <laughs> People who make as much money as you should make their money go around. Oh, give me a break, Leon. I love a good garage sale. Oh, dear, oh, dear, oh, dear. And better to be a terrible mammal than a judgmental radio host who talks on topics he knows nothing about, says Graham of Camberwell, who I reckon we can read between the lines. He's probably one of those mammals. Good on him. I love him. Oh, aren't you sweet? <laughs> Jacinta Parsons, my co-host, I'm John Fain. Our first guest on the conversation hour today is the former Australian Human Rights and Race Discrimination Commissioner, Graham Innes. He's written a book called Finding a Way, and it's the story of a man very determined not to let his blindness get in the way of whatever it is he wants to do in life, including learning to ride a bicycle incredibly topically. Graham, good morning to you. Good morning, John. Good to see you and congratulations on, uh, well, I, I said retiring from the Human Rights Commission and you've already told me that you're not retired. No, I'm, uh, I'm very busy. I'm uh, a company director on a number of boards, including the, the Summer Foundation down here in Victoria, but I'm also doing a whole lot of public presentations and a few consultancies. I'm almost as busy as I was at the Commission. Are you going to be one of those retired people who says, I don't know how I had time to work? Yes, a bit like that. Yeah. <laughs> how yeah. did you learn to ride a bicycle as a child? It's well, astonishing. Uh, uh, it's w one of the interesting uh, stories because um, my parents didn't place restrictions on me in general terms, um, but this was one restriction. They said that I couldn't have a two-wheeler bike because they didn't think I'd be able to ride it uh, well enough because I wouldn't be able to go fast enough so they wanted me to stay with my trike so I just stole my sister and brother's bikes and wouldn't give them back until uh, I got my own two-wheeler bike. How does a blind kid ride a bike? I just took it outside when uh, no one else was at home or there was one person at home and but they were inside and just uh, got on a big square of grass and fell off and fell off until I got it right. How did you know where you were going? Oh, well, I knew the grass pretty, uh, pretty well. We, we lived in a, a, a property with a lot of area and I knew there was a croquet-sized a court of grass and I could hear from the traffic going up and down the street approximately where I was in that grass. Once I learned to ride the bike, then I rode around the... There was some driveways and paths so I, I could just follow those, so it wasn't too hard. What did your parents think when they... Uh you know, realised that you'd done that? Well, they saw me riding the two-wheeler bike, so they, they sort of um, had to give in, really, and get me my own bike because I'd, I wouldn't give my other sisters back until I got one. <laughs> but that's... that's It's kind of like a typifying mm. your attitude to everything, whether personal, professional, romantic, financial, every challenge you tell us in the book that's ever come up, your, your can-do approach just gets you through. Well, uh, someone said that uh, what, my, what shines through in my book is my persistence. Others have called it stubbornness. Uh, it's, it's somewhere in there. And uh, I do take that view that um, if people with disabilities are not limited in what we do, and my parents very much took the attitude that uh, I was one of three siblings and they wouldn't n lower expectations by limiting what I did. And uh, so uh, that meant that I had a, a broad vista of... of what things there were out there to do and very much was um, encouraged to take the attitude that I could do anything I wanted. Which you clearly went on to do, although there are some, there's some down moments in the book. For instance, your attempts to find a job when you graduated from university mm. was a bit of a, a sobering experience as I read your book. Uh, well, life hasn't been without challenges and just because I'm determined to do things doesn't mean that some of them haven't been pretty hard to do and, and finding my first job was certainly one of those. I went to about 30 interviews over that 12-month period and didn't get any of those jobs, uh, mainly, I think, because people just couldn't accept that a blind person could work as a lawyer. And uh, uh, despite the fact that at every interview I explained what the issues would be and how I intended to overcome them, I couldn't persuade an employer to uh, give me a chance. So I decided that I had to find a different way. And that really is the purpose of the so title of the book. I, I mean, it's a bit of a play, that title, because as a blind person, you do have to find find a way. But um, I've, I've worked to find a way to achieve what I wanted during my life. And so it's that double meaning. And, uh, and so I took a job uh, at the bottom rung of the New South Wales Public Service 
Uh, and uh, as, as a clerk, even though you had a law degree. Yes, I, and I used to joke I was the only clerk in the public service with a law degree, and that yeah. first job, John, was answering the phone and telling people the winning lotto numbers, and, of course, you need a law degree for that. <laughs> <laughs> what I loved reading as well in this book was those very first moments of your adv- advocacy work. There was a moment in the book where one of your friends was trying to learn how to smoke Mm. And even though everyone around him thought this was really inappropriate to be teaching someone how to smoke, you thought it was an important thing. Why was that? Well, uh, I thought he had as much right to um, learn how to smoke and uh, potentially kill himself as uh, <laughs> uh, as anyone else. And, I, and, I, and b- other people could pick up cigarettes and a match and light it and do that. And he couldn't. And that was a real advocacy issue for me. So I advocated on his behalf, tried to encourage teachers and or supervisors at the school camp and when they wouldn't teach him um, I found another way so I, I just took him away somewhere quietly and I showed him how to light the cigarette <laughs> I hope he's not smoking still but you know uh, I thought he was entitled if he wanted to do that to, to be able to blind kids aren't supposed to be naughty though Graham no no but nor are uh, nor are young women at schools who uh, sign and swear words but uh, uh, <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, I mean, kids with disabilities aren't supposed to be naughty. We're not naughty. We're we're asexual. Uh, we don't have strong views. We shouldn't speak up. Yeah. Uh, all the sorts of things that I'm just not prepared to accept and challenge. Yeah, and that's how much things have changed. And you know, you're not paragons of virtue either. Is absolutely, the other point. absolutely not. No, I've done some very naughty things in my time. Would you like to tell us what they are? <laughs> oh well, I did some naughty things at school, uh, such as stealing the uh, school bell when the classes were due to recommence, and um, hiding out the window. So and the hiding outside the window. It. Yes, that's true. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure that I want to fess up to some of the adult naughty things that I've done, John. <laughs> well, in fact, the book is very personal. You tell us about the rocky start to what has turned out to be an enduring marriage, but mm. it didn't go smoothly at the beginning. No, it didn't. Um, and I think um, my wife Maureen was uh, still, um, you know raw from her divorce from her previous husband and um, just didn't think marriage was the, the way to go and, and I, I felt that it was and I was uh, determined to change her mind and sort of chased around the world to... Literally chased around the world. Yeah, yeah, to, to achieve that. I think it was eventually the, um, the lunch at the Roman uh, roadside cafe with the, um, with the musicians uh, riding up on their bikes, there's bikes again, uh, on their push bikes and playing to us while I proposed. I think that's what finally got me over the line. I don't know. Or you could just be a blind stalker who, in the end, she gave in to. It's funny that you should say that, but someone suggested on radio a week or two ago that she probably should have taken out an AVO. On <laughs> I reckon she would have been on the cusp of it <laughs> yeah. after you bombarded her with flowers and chocolates deliveries and, and yep, chocolates yep, and all yep. from the other side of the world, in True. fact, when she disappeared and vanished to the other side of the globe to try and get away from you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My, my argument, my legal argument would be that she uh, gave me her itinerary, so there was a... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> There's um, so many beautiful, rich memories in this book, um, and memoir's interesting, isn't it, how we recall things that have happened in our life. Is your memory very good, or did you keep journals? Well, uh, no, I didn't keep a journal, Jacinta, but um, it's funny you should say that, because uh, I asked my 19-year-old daughter if she was going to come to my book launch, and she sort of said, oh, no, I don't think I'll come to that. She said, I've heard all those stories. I'm not sure that I believe a lot of them, so (laughs) um, memory is a bit uh, the way it's in your head. But no, I wrote it all from memory. I've got some very vivid memories of my childhood and my youth, and... um, uh, and and working as an adult, and I I sat down, and the tricky part for me was what to put in and what to leave out, um, because my publisher said I had to write between ninety and hundred thousand words, and I think I started at one hundred and forty thousand, uh, and then my editor and I had some interesting dialogues and uh, got it down to about ninety. What's also really special about reading this memoir is that uh, we get a little bit of an insight, I suppose, into those memories as told through the other senses. Mm. You explain them in ways that are really rich. There's smells, there's there's, there's hearing, there's so many great things. Is that obviously, um, you know, an important way of of communicating that stuff? Well, it's the way I interact with the world and and I very consciously wanted to write the book from my perspective, so without one sense but with the heightened awareness of the information that you get through other senses. So I I did that very consciously because I thought that would be of interest to people um, and and, uh, hopefully that's been successful. I loved your description of how you never knew what the Sydney Harbour Bridge looked like until mm. someone allowed you to touch a model and then you understood the coat hanger reference yeah. and so on. And it suddenly just opens our minds, those of us who just have never had to doubt sight, 
to open our minds to just how big the hurdles are, but also how innovative you are in overcoming them. Um, yeah, look, I, I mean, I think uh, the philosophy that I've worked with is that you, you you play the hand of cards that you're dealt the best way you can. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, this is... Um, but there's no self-pity whatsoever in your approach, your can-do approach. It's the opposite of that. Well, look, uh, I want to get the maximum I can out of uh, the time that I'm here. And, uh, and I think the way to do that is to, uh, is to get on with it. And um, it doesn't mean that I, that I don't find some things hard, and it doesn't mean that I don't have a, a recognition of the uh, impact of the, the societal impact on people with disabilities. I'm very well aware of that. And the major barriers that people with disabilities face are the ones which society puts up to stop us doing things. Um, and so I, I, I challenge those. I'm, I'm well aware of those things, but uh, I'm not going to let them stop me or slow me down. And then the interesting thing you talk about in the book and you speak about a lot is that soft discrimination where expectations are lowered oh, for yeah. people with disability. Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, I'm sure your next guest will talk about that as well. But, you know, the, the assumptions... I don't think you should have that make that assumption whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll see who's right, John. But um, <laughs> the, uh, the assumptions uh, that people make about what you can't do uh, as a person with a disability are the major challenges which we face. And so I've, I've committed uh, much of my life to, um, trying to um, trying to address challenging those assumptions. And in fact, one of the boards I chair now is the Attitude Foundation, which is uh, determined to change attitudes using television and other broader, broader media um, by having people with disabilities tell our own stories and, and, and tell what our life experiences are. Has there been much change in, in the time um, that you've been advocating for change? Yes, I think there has been. Uh, I tried to do a bit of a run-through of the changes uh, when I spoke to the National Press Club towards the end of my term as uh, Commissioner at the Australian Human Rights Commission, and I think there has been some progress, but you know, as any good advocate in a field would say, we've still got a long way to go, I think, and uh, so we have to keep keep pushing. But Yes, I think I can see that we're heading in the right direction. Is there anything that you've ever found you can't do? Oh, I'm sure there is. I'm just thinking about... Um, you've played cricket for Australia, you've participated in sport, you've travelled widely, you've had kids, an extraordinarily successful career, blah, 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 blah. Is there anything you've ever found that defeated you? Um, there are things that I've done once or twice and then thought, oh, I don't think I really want to do that again. Um, like what? Well, like snow skiing or um, uh, stuff like that, where I just felt... You're not alone there. Yeah, well, <laughs> sure, sure. But <clears throat> I just felt a bit um, a bit out of control, and I also don't like being cold, so... Um, I'd, I'd like I meant more professionally or in daily life or in personal interactions with people. I mean, you have an extraordinary good humour, you have an extraordinarily friendly approach to the world, and you charm people as much as anything else, but does it ever defeat you? Um, but there are certainly uh, things that I attempted to do when I was commissioner that I wasn't able to achieve. I mean, some um, improvements in the legislation around the National Disability Insurance Scheme that I couldn't convince government on, some amendments to the sure. um, discrimination legislation that I thought would, uh, still think would work very effectively. But uh, but that's but not government... because you were blind. You didn't fail there because you were blind. You failed there because the political challenge was insurmountable. Sure. Uh, well, insurmountable at that time. See, I never accept that you can't come back to these things. Um, but uh, if you're asking me, is there anything that I haven't been able to do because of my disability, I, I suppose the regret that I would have is that I'd love to have been able to um, see my wife and my daughter. Um, and uh, I'm sad that I can't do that, but I'm not going to let it stop me uh, continuing with what I do. And I'm not going to sort of spend a lot of time thinking about that. But um, you know your family and your loved ones sure. through through all the other senses, oh, yes. through touch, through sound, through smell and so on. So what do you think you're missing out on? Uh, well, I suppose I really don't know, John. Uh, it's, it's hard for me to, to know. Uh, I don't have that concept. Um, people say that um, blind people... Uh, live in a world of darkness or see black. Uh, from my experience, both my own and talking to other blind people, that's just inherently wrong. 
Um, I think if, it's different for people who were born blind, isn't it, like you were, compared to someone who, for instance, may have sight and then lose it. Um, there is some nuances, but I don't know any blind person that I've spoken to who, who's, who um, sees black or darkness, um, and I've, I've chatted to a few about it. Um, but I think that um, when you don't have a sense, you don't, hear, you don't have it. So um, you know, someone who is uh, completely deaf um, doesn't hear something you know they just don't hear anything mm. so i don't know what i've missed but i'm sad that i've missed out on that i'd like to have been okay. able to see my wife and my daughter if i if i waved the magic wand at 23 minutes to 12 mm. on the 2nd of august and said we've got the new bionic eye ready to go do you want to be the first person mm. do you say yes or no uh, well i personally would say yes um, because I'd like to have that experience that I haven't had. But I know and respect many people in the disability field who are of the view, and, and other people who are blind or vision impaired. And I was actually talking to someone uh, a couple of weeks ago about this very subject. And they said that they wouldn't have their sight back because they didn't think they'd be able to um, deal with the, or they didn't want to deal with the challenges of having to deal with an extra sense, whereas, you know, I'm prepared to give it a crack. But you'd have, to re, you'd have to relearn everything. We yes. don't yeah. ask you, John Fain, if you would, if we could wave, wave a magic wand that you would, you would lose your sight. I no. mean, it's similarly a, 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 the same question in a way, isn't it? Because uh, Graham's experience is unique in what it is. Yeah, I'm not sure that it's the same question, though, Jacinta, because you're taking something away rather than um, making an extra thing available, and I think that's sort of a bit different. Um, but but uh, my view, personally, would be, yeah, I'd give it a crack. But then that's my view generally, so, um, yeah, I'll, I'll have a go at things. I'll, I'll, I'll reach for those, those next levels. Congratulations on the book, Graham, which... Apart from anything else, it's just a rollicking good yarn of a remarkable Thanks, life well lived, as especially though if you are in any way connected to anybody who's dealing with disability and overcoming people's expectations. Well, there's so many things in here that will inspire you. Graham Innes, former Disability and Human Rights Commissioner, Finding a Way is the title of the book. The Melbourne launch is at Williamstown Library this evening at half past six if you want to go along. And the book has been published by the University of Queensland Press. Graeme Inners, former Human Rights and Race Discrimination Commissioner and Disability Commissioner, who is now definitely not retired, but chairing Attitude Australia and also doing lots of other things, as he told us. Jacinta Parsons, my co-host, in a moment, our live stream continues with Vic Def's Jen Blythe from Deaf Victoria, their advocacy manager. She joins us in a moment. Livestream.com slash VicDef is where you can watch. I've got some lovely text messages, including one from Kate saying, I'm so excited to be able to watch the radio. I often wonder what it's like in the environment. My brother-in-law works on radio. He used to work with 774. Brad McKenzie. Hi, Brad. Thank you so much for having us along today, says Kate. Lovely, and thank you. Things haven't changed that much. I wish they had, but they really haven't. People with disabilities still seen in a negative light all too much, says Amy in Oakley. And I'm watching the live stream. I'm just distracted by the producer's loud jumper in the background. <laughs> Luckily, I understand Auslan so I can hear the conversation over the top of the loud jumper, says Jess. <laughs> oh, there's so much we didn't think about as we put this program together. But in a moment, Jen Blythe joins us. It's coming up to 20 minutes to 12 on 774 ABC Melbourne, ABC Victoria and digital radio and streaming on the internet at abc.net.au slash Melbourne and at livestream.com slash VicDef. <laughs>
wished you'd said because it's their jobs and their life that they're talking about <laughs> they might be just adding a little bit and embellishing <laughs> well. that's why Jacinta's here isn't it? <laughs> I can read one word <laughs> Um, Jen, I'm interested to know about that relationship that you have with your interpreters. What makes a good interpreter? They're sitting right here, well, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> they are, yes, I know, I can see them. <laughs> well, I think a great sense of humour is a really important quality. Um, it's good to have a, a really good connection with your assigned interpreter um, and an understanding of each other. And obviously the skills that are required for the job are so very important for uh, interpreting. And also, you know, the attitude. And uh, it's, inter it's important that interpreters uh, have a really a sound sense of ethics as well. Do you, um, does it take a while to build that relationship? Well, yes, uh, I think it can. I mean, obviously, I've been deaf since birth. My parents are both deaf as well. So, you know, I'd say that I have a lifelong experience of working with interpreters uh, from day one. And I think you, you know, you learn the basics as you go along and, and you go from there. So do you and I think some relationships are easy and others you have to work on a bit harder. So do you relate to what Graham was saying before about how as much as anything your outcomes in life will depend on the attitude to the disability? Oh, 100%. I could not support that statement strongly enough. When you said that, Graham, I was just, you know, little jumps of joys inside <laughs> me because I agree 100%. And you describe yourself as deaf with a capital D. Can you explain what that means? I do, I do indeed, yes. So I guess what we'd say for deaf people with a capital D is that they're culturally deaf. So I identify as a deaf person, not as someone with a hearing loss. Um, so I guess, you know, I have a lot of involvement in assigned culture, in deaf theatre, deaf poetry, deaf experiences. And that's what we might say for someone who is culturally deaf. Does that sort of give you a bit of an idea? Absolutely. Um, I read somewhere that it really is about a state of mind. It's not simply about uh, a sense. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think for deaf, uh, you know, people in the deaf community, that would be certainly true. And that's why, Jen, isn't it, that uh, it's so important to um, have Auslan interpreters recognised in the same way as interpreters um, for people whose first language is, is not English? Precisely. We've seen that come up in the news just yesterday regarding, uh, you know, the AFL Grand Final mm. and the need for interpreters to be part of that. Some people have said, well, why not captioning? Why isn't that good enough? Yeah, well, I guess that um, when you think about Auslan, it's a different uh, language to English. The grammar is different. We see captions and that's just English. Um, and there are people in the deaf community who you would say are not fluent users of English. Their first language is Auslan. Uh, that's the language they use in their world, in their life, in their community. And that's what they'd like to see at those sorts of events. Can you learn another language? Can you learn French or Italian or something else? Uh, well, I think the spoken element of it is obviously tricky. Um, I'm not a person who perhaps could pick that up easily. I'm not sure about other deaf people. But in terms of other sign languages around the world, absolutely. Um, and I think that there's a lot of uh, deaf people who are quite accustomed to American Sign Language or ASL. There's French Sign Language. And it's important to know that sign languages around the world are all different. Mm. So there's capacity there for sure. Do you get sign language interpreters who interpret between English, Auslan, French, Auslan, Chinese, I mean, whatever other language? So in Australia, probably not so much. I think that uh, the interpreters that we use in Australia are Auslan interpreters, so yeah. they work between Auslan and spoken English. But, uh, you know, and I wouldn't say that many Auslan interpreters are fluent in other sign languages. I'm wondering what would happen, for instance, if you had someone who was deaf but from a, I don't know, let's say a Greek background, and they needed to sign in Greek, and you needed to find an Auslan interpreter who could understand Greek Auslan and translate it into English at the same time. It's starting to do my head in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look, I think in that situation, you'd probably work with an interpreter who is themselves deaf. So someone we call a deaf interpreter. Right. So we'd have that deaf person in the room uh, who, so you, you know, is able to work uh, in the language that that person's using, in a visual gestural language. So you'd have an, a sign interpreter who would then be interpreted into another language, so you'd need a team of... It's like a chain, almost, conversation. 
Exactly, exactly. Wow, I yes. can imagine what your international conferences So it becomes must very be. complex. <laughs> and John, this comes up in the Northern Territory where some uh -huh. uh, deaf people in Aboriginal communities yeah. uh, have a sign language that is uh, that has been developed within their Aboriginal community and it's certainly not Auslan. And so particularly in court proceedings where I've, um, where I've run into it, yeah. uh, you have to have interpreters who can uh, sign in that particular, so exactly as the way that Jen says. Yeah, yeah, I can well imagine Ooh. how yes. it must go. I mean, for instance... I'd like to think that you come in here with your guide dog. No one questions Graham Innes walking around the community and going about his business with a guide dog yeah, anymore. Yeah, chance would be a nice thing, but anyway, yeah. Well, does it still happen? <laughs> oh, yes, yeah, still happens sometimes. Not a lot, but sometimes. But anyway, I'm sorry, I interrupted you. No, 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 because what I'm trying to do, I suppose, is to contrast the experience of one mm. type of disability mm. for one sense with the experience of a, another disability that's lost a different sense mm. and or doesn't have a different sense and what we the assumptions that we make and take for granted mm. comparing the different forms of of discrimination and then within the broader disability field the um the issues with which we need to deal uh, working together um, on multiple disability issues. Uh, I well remember the time that I served with a woman, um, Bobby Blackson, who you probably know, Jen, who um, yes, uh, was on the same council as me, and we used to travel by plane together, and uh, she did the uh, uh, the guiding and um, and uh, and I did the sort of the talking and uh, combination worked very nicely but uh, it was challenging to a few other members of the public. <laughs> I guess uh, looking at disability as a broad as a broad subject, what do you both think are the greatest barriers that we still face for social change against discrimination? Well, I think people's attitude. That's that's the first thing. You know, I think that people, you know, just make assumptions that because we have a disability, we can't do things or that we're of a lesser intelligence, um, you know, that, that a disability or a physical one is related to a cognitive impairment, mm. which is certainly not true. Graham, what would you have to say? Oh, I totally agree. The soft bigotry of low expectations is how I describe it. The soft and bigotry of low of expectations. Low expectations. Yes. Yep. Which is people being patronising. Absolutely. And uh, I'm, I don't know whether... Um, uh, Jen gets people, uh, you know, pointing energetically and doing things for her, but I certainly get people who yell at me. For oh, sure. yeah. um, you know, because so you're blind, so yeah. we've got to shout. Can That's you right. hear me? Exactly, exactly. So it's it's all about those limits, and uh, so I completely agree with you, Jen. And Graham, you mentioned in the book too a, a really um, huge issue around feeling invisible, where people will talk to people that you're with. I'm sure, Jen, people talk to your interpreters 100%. rather than yes. to you. Yes, Is yes, that? all the time. Yeah. All the time, so I, you know, I'll go somewhere and introduce myself, um, and people will look at the interpreter straight away, mm. um, you know, and have that conversation with the interpreter, you know. And so they ask the interpreter questions rather than engaging with me, and you know, it's so I guess I have to take back ownership of that conversation mm. as best I can. How do you do that? Well, you know, I just tell them, you know, uh, you know, look at me. I'm the one who's made the appointment. Um, I've, I've brought with me a, an interpreter to help with the communication between the two of us. So direct your focus at me, that sort of thing. And, you know, I think it, it can be very awkward and it's a very tough space to navigate. Is it getting better with, I don't know, medical appointments or legal appointments or whatever else it is? Mm, yes and no. Um, I think that, you know, a lot of people have a greater awareness uh, but there's still a lot of barriers. Um, and I think that we'll always have those. How do you maintain patience for this change to happen? It feels like we're requiring you to do a lot here, you know, in that way. That's such a good question. Um, it's just continuous. And I think that, you know, I grew up as an advocate in a deaf family. And I think you have to choose your battles. I think you have to be strategic. You know, and sometimes you just let things slide, um, you know, and... It's not, you know, it's not the end of the day, you know, I'm not going to die because of that. Sometimes you just have to make that call. And sometimes you don't. Sometimes you aren't patient and you, um, and, yes. you know, you, are, you respond in a, in a grumpy way and, and I've certainly done that. Um, oh, you've never been grumpy in your oh, life. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I wish that were true, John. I wish that were true. But well, publicly I've never known you to be grumpy and I've been at plenty of places where you've spoken from over the years and you're, you're a man of enormous good humour. Um, I try not to be grumpy, but I, I don't always succeed. So there you go, that answers one of your earlier questions. I don't always succeed at not being grumpy. There are some times when I make a pretty cutting um, comment uh, you know, in response to something that, that happens to me that I think is pretty inappropriate. What's the worst thing that anyone's ever done or said because of your disability? For me, it's, um, 
it's just thinking that, well, apart from the, the conversations at shop counters where I'll walk up with my wife or daughter or a friend and I'll, ask, I'll make the request, I'll hand the people the money and they'll pass the change back to, to my wife. I mean... Happens and, to me too. Yeah, well, yeah, OK. Um, <laughs> I'm... Uh, but... Um, no, I mean, I, think, I mean in the, in, the, in the spheres in which you've operated as Human Rights Commissioner, you've been lobbying, you've been a regular around the corridors of Parliament House and places of power for a decade or so. What's the worst thing that ever happened? Um, I guess... Uh, couple of things. One is that people think it's okay to just um, push me or pull me in particular directions rather than explaining where things are. You mean physically? Yes. They think they're guiding you? Absolutely. Um, and uh, so that happens. But I think the politicians uh, and bureaucrats that I admire uh, most are the ones who, even though they may have had a, a disagreement with me or I, I've criticised them, um, come up to me at airport lounges and um, and say hello or, or in the street or whatever. Um, I think the worst thing that's happened is a couple of people that I know were at functions that I was at and they very clearly um, chose to not let me know that they were there, I found out later on. Mm -hmm. I think that's really taking advantage of a situation. Jen? Well, I think probably the worst thing that's ever happened to me, I, I wouldn't know where to start really, but I think that that, um, that soft, a soft approach to low expectations, that soft discrimination, that's mm. certainly not new to me and that's something that I experience regular, yeah. regularly. But I think, you know, um, when you talk about looking for work, Graham, um, and I think that that's a huge barrier for deaf mm. people. Mm. We often, you know, make many, many applications and sit through many, many yep. interviews um, without, getting a, without getting a go and without getting a job and I think that can be a really... Um, yep demoralising part yeah, of... That's that cloak work. of invisibility that yeah. Graham writes about, absolutely yeah. so. And, Jen, yes. just interested too, you've just become um, a parent a couple of years ago. Graham, you speak about it as well in your book. Mm. That's another huge issue where, where things really come up, don't they? Well, yeah, I guess, yeah, with my son, um, you know, going to the hospital with him, and not having an interpreter provided. I didn't have an interpreter automatically provided for the birth. I had to go through an advocacy process to get access to an interpreter for a birth. Um, you know, they thought, I thought that I wouldn't be coherent to lip read through that process. You know, I'm, I've been pregnant for nine months and that was a really stressful time and a really challenging time. I did successfully advocate to have an interpreter provided at the birth, but I know a lot of deaf people I don't get that to happen for them in the end, which is just terrible. Well, so many text messages. We're reminded of Stella Young smiling oh, at yeah. smiling at a set of stairs won't turn them into a ramp. Correct. And Stella, thank you again. And boy, you are missed. That's absolutely true. Uh, I've got goosebumps watching how proficient your sign interpreters are. And I'm not deaf, says Sonia and Rosanna. Just fascinating to watch. Thank you to whoever organised this. I went to the Deaf Olympics in Melbourne years ago. Found it very easy to communicate Auslan and using expression. And on and on the text messages go. And lots and lots of people saying how fabulous it is that the ABC has uh, made the commitment to make this work uh, uh, the first and last live radio I'll ever listen to. This is what radio is all about. I've always wondered. Great interview, Jen and Graham. So thank you very much, Jen. It's been great to have you here. Thank you. Jen Blythe, Advocacy Manager of Deaf Victoria, who rang in on our National Disability Insurance Scheme Talkback Forum about Auslan interpreters, and her words have been interpreted for us today by Maxine Buxton and Melissa Martin, and the live stream has been done by Michael Paramore and Niaz Bohanuddin. Graham Inner's book is called Finding a Way, and the book launch is at Williamstown Library this evening at half past six. Jacinta Parsons has been my co-host, and this afternoon on the radio, Claire Bowditch is back after having been where? For the last day or At two Gama or three. in East Arnhem Land after nine hours of transit yesterday and the red dust still in my hair. Great to be back, John. What an extraordinary conversation hour too. Thank you. Are we going to hear some Gama stories on the radio this afternoon? You are. We'll be talking about language as well. We'll pick that up. But what else are you going to hear this afternoon? Extraordinary. Two songs at least from the Soweto Gospel Choir. 21 human beings cramming into this room to sing live for you. We'll also be talking about men and grief. I've got David Mallard, president of Melbourne Men's Group, Good joined grief. together with Griefline, and I'll be asking him to explain that to us and 
see what how we can help people out there in the community. Men who can't come to terms with grief. Yes, and don't have a language around it and are oh. encouraged to have a language around it. Excellent. Very interesting topics with Claire on the radio this afternoon. Graham Inners, Jen Blythe, Jacinta Parsons, thank you all for coming and our thanks to Maxine, Melissa, Michael and Niaz as well and 77 for ABC Melbourne, ABC Victoria. This has been The Conversation Hour.